Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is a very popular guest who's been on the show before making delicious recipes in her beautiful kitchen. She is from Veg Inspired, and she is named Kathy Davis, and she has something brand new she's going to talk about today. Please welcome her to the show. I love your shirt, and it's so nice to see you again. Thanks, Chef AJ. Hi, everybody. Great to be here with you. I'm so excited to share everything today. So let's roll. Well, you know, I can't wait. And like just looking at you right now, it looks like you're in a beautiful kitchen and you are. But I think if people haven't heard your story before, they might not know that your kitchen is movable. It's on wheels. It is. It is. About four years ago, my husband and I sold our house in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to hit the road full time in a fifth wheel RV and we are traveling the United States, visiting all the national parks. We just were in Maine right now and this is our 29th state. How exciting is that? And I think it's our 23rd national park when we just visited Acadia National Park. Are you documenting this? Cause to me, this would make an a very interesting book or blog or website. Uh, a little bit. It's a little bit weaved into the Veg Inspired Instagram, um, but we do have a book that we're writing in after every stay to remember what we're doing. And, you know, maybe it'll turn into a memoir someday. You never know. <laughs> wow. Do you anticipate this being the rest of your life or maybe one day settling somewhere? And if so, where do you think you'll settle? Oh, uh, it's so hard. We, we keep saying that we're going to go as far as we can see. And then when we get there, we'll kind of know what direction we're going to take. Uh, we do find that we enjoy the, um, I guess it's the Western part of Florida in like the old Florida Ocala kind of area with lots of those big live Oak trees. We also really loved the Arizona area. Uh, we love Montana, but don't see ourselves in that type of an environment in the winter. So right now it's just, Chasing the sunshine, flip flop weather for us. Right, wow, that's just such. That's so interesting. I mean, but, but do you have kids, Kathy? We don't. Just a cat. I was going to say because, like, if you did, I mean, if you were raising kids, that might be, a, you know, an, an interesting life for them. You know, because where would they go to school? They would probably be homeschooled. We actually meet a lot of people on the road that they call it road schooling, and basically, they're teaching them their homeschool curriculum from their RV and taking them to all these neat places. And it's just a different way of teaching. And I'm a former school teacher. So I love that kids are getting out and getting those types of experiences. That is very, very, very cool. You know, I'm, I'm I, people, even though I've traveled a lot for work, I really am a homebody, but you can still be a homebody because your RV is your home. It just happens to be on wheels. Absolutely. We have all the comforts of a home. We have a kitchen. We even have a fireplace and, you know, we have a king size bed. We have everything that we need. And the, the cool thing is we take our bed with us. We're always sleeping in our bed. We don't have to sleep in, you know, a bed somewhere else. So that's, that's kind of fun. That really is cool. And as long as you have an instant pot and air fryer, Hey, I can go anywhere with you. Exactly. Yeah. So over your left shoulder, is that a refrigerator? Because that looks like a beautiful refrigerator if it is one. It is. It is. It's a refrigerator. It's a what's called an RV refrigerator. So it runs on both electric and propane. Nice. So you're the CEO of Veg Inspired. That's what your t-shirt says. What's Veg Inspired? The way to inspire people to eat more vegetables, perhaps? Yeah. Absolutely. So I started Veg Inspired about eight years ago with the goal to educate, inspire, and empower people to eat more plants. And it's really evolved into so much, right? We have recipes, we've, I've authored some cookbooks, um, and now have coaching and now, uh, you know, working with people to help them leverage the power of plant foods to really meet their personal and professional goals, whether it's a weight loss goal, or even just having the energy to show up in their business, their career, or for their family. You know, so many people go through life skipping meals and eating foods that don't, don't provide that nourishment and that energy. And so at Veg Inspired, we, we want to help people. We want to make plant-based eating more accessible to people. Yeah. And if you can do it on the road 365 days a year, somebody with like a permanent residence could probably do it too. 
Absolutely. I always tell people the one thing I miss is going to the same grocery store. You know, you, you fall in love a little bit with your grocery store. You know where everything is. You know what products to expect. We don't have that luxury moving around the country. That's true. We're surprised I, I at every grocery experience. I know what you mean because you kind of get used to not just shopping at your favorite store because sometimes stores have more than one location, but your favorite location and your favorite checker and you know where everything is because that even Trader Joe's, they're different in different cities because you kind of like know what aisle and, and that, that is interesting that you have to like relearn that every shopping experience. Every time. Yeah. Are there are there grocery stores that you found in, in states that you are not familiar with that are just like blowing you away? Definitely. Definitely. Now we grew up in Western New York, my husband and I, so we knew what Wegmans was, but it's every time we go, it's just like this amazing experience. Uh, we've fallen in love with Publix. We actually look in Florida to see where those are. And then along the ways, one of the, the one of the unique experiences is finding smaller grocery stores, you know, eating a whole food plant-based, you know, following a whole food, food plant-based way of eating. We aren't necessarily looking for the store to have all the vegan products, right? I really just need them to have potatoes, vegetables, beans, rice, some tofu, maple syrup, you know, the things that I keep in my, in my kitchen as a standard. And sometimes it's those small little mom and pop local corner markets that really blow you away. You know, there's a really great one that we just found in Bar Harbor that has everything we could use. I mean, we could shop there and not have to travel, you know, 20 minutes into the nearest town to, um, or bigger town to, to a standard grocery store. So sometimes it's worth checking out those little mom and pop places to find your, your whole food ingredients. Right. You know, it's interesting because I've moved several times in the last few years and I was always so attached to particular stores, but I live in Northern California now and there's a store that I've heard of from my sister who's always lived in Northern California called Rayleigh's. And it's like, I would consider it more like a regular grocery store as opposed to like a specialty store like mm -hmm. Whole Foods. And it's fabulous. Like I literally, as a vegan for 45 years, I can find everything I want there. There's only one item I can't find there that I have to go to Trader Joe's for that my husband loves called Cruciferous Crunch, but they have everything organic, I mean, vegan yogurt, vegan, not that I eat vegan ice cream, but I mean, I, I mean, I'm, I'm in love with this store that I never even heard of. Exactly. And that's the cool part, right? Finding these places that, that can, that can meet our needs, no matter where we eat on that plant-based or vegan spectrum. Yeah, that's great. In case people didn't see the previous shows we did, which were fabulous, by the way, maybe tell people when you adopted a vegan or plant-based diet and why. Awesome. I have been an ethical vegan for about eight years and I resisted it in the beginning. My husband, it was his idea. He read a couple of contradictory articles and I, you know, I wasn't all in. I grew up in a family that ate animal products. I didn't want to give up those foods. And it took about six months of trying it, really experiencing the plant-based foods. You know, the sauces made from cashews, the the, the pasta and veggie dishes, you know, foods that I really enjoyed. And as the more familiar plant foods that he fed me and the meals that I ate, and I started to experience it, I realized plant-based eating wasn't what I thought it was going to be. And my pivot moment was I was standing in a field. Um, I had been at a friend's house and their, their family raised cows to be slaughtered. And one of the cows had just had a baby and I'm standing in the field, watching this mom, nurture her little baby. And I was like, I'm done. I'm not eating bait animals anymore. Like I am done. This is it. This is my pivot point. Don't feed me animal products anymore. I'm vegan. And then about three, it's almost three years now. Uh, I actually had a pivot moment of, from a health perspective, I still, and I was at my highest weight ever I made a decision that I was going to change, change my vegan way of eating to follow a cleaner, more whole food, plant-based, mostly unprocessed way of living. I've lost almost 50 pounds, but I always tell people it's not the weight loss, right? It's the energy. It's the wellness. It's the, the vibrancy of life. You know, my brother-in-law said, I think you look younger now than you did, you know, four or five, six years ago. You know, it's just being able to do the things. And I, I was telling my clients the other day, I, we've been hiking more and in Acadia, most of the trails are a little bit strenuous. 
because it's very rocky. It's, it's mountainous. And I would have never been able to do some of the hikes that we did 50 pounds heavier. It just wouldn't have, I just physically wouldn't have been able to do it. And to be able to achieve these milestones, it's changing the way that I eat. I, I attribute all of the successes that I've had in the last two and a half years to, you know, making the decision to eat whole plant foods, mostly unprocessed most of the time. Nice. Like, yeah, it's interesting that, that you made the association with a, a mother cow and the baby cow that many people will go their whole lives eating animals and never realize that it's a living being. <laughs> really? I mean, it's, it's just, we just don't make that connection, unfortunately. And that's, that's not the connection that the, the industries want us to make either, I suppose. So they, they paint it as a different picture. What did you do before you became Kathy Davis from Veg Inspired, because I know you've written three books. Now, feel free to brag. And if you have them to show us, let us know what they are. Absolutely. I was a school teacher by trade. I went to school to be to be a, an elementary school teacher. I taught for about seven years. And then I kind of moved myself into uh, more of administrative positions in different companies and caught the entrepreneurial spirit. And I when I started Veg Inspired, it was a side gig. When we hit the road full time, it became a full time a full-time, you know, passion. And, in, you know, when, before I changed the way that I ate, I really was just showing people how easy vegan could be. And now I'm more on a mission to show people how accessible eating whole foods can be and how that can really change their lives. You know, I talk a lot about energy, a lot about wellness, a lot about more productivity, being able to show up confident and, and as your best self, because three years ago, I wasn't there. I mean, if you go back and watch my old YouTube videos, you can see a difference in energy, excitement, enthusiasm. And I believe it's the food. I truly believe that the joy that I have in life is based on the fact that I feed myself beautiful, colorful, delicious, whole plant foods. And so, yes, I have authored three cookbooks, all plant-based. Uh, two of them are totally oil, salt, and refined sugar-free, which I love. That's really how I eat. And yeah, I do have them. They're behind me. Yeah, show us, show us one at a time and tell us a little bit like the difference between the books in case people don't have them yet. Sure thing. So this is the super easy plant-based cookbook. This is actually the cookbook that I'm going to share some recipes from in a little while. And then we have the 30 minute whole food plant-based cookbook. Oh, I should tell you a little bit about this one first. So this cookbook is, Des designed to be more of a guide. It has four categories that the recipes are divided into. No cook, five ingredient, 30 minutes, and then one pot. And I will tell you, I have become a one pot fan. There's nothing easier than throwing everything on a sheet pan, sticking it in the oven, and then going about the rest of my day. No more standing over the, the stove or having a dozen dishes to wash because isn't that the biggest complaint I have in the RVs that I don't have a dishwasher? Oh, so the 30 minute whole food. Go ahead. I was going to say there is no dishwasher other than you personally. Yeah. Me, my hands on the dishwasher, unfortunately. So, so the one pots are, are perfect. Uh, the next one is the 30 minute whole food plant-based cookbook. Now this one is one of the, um, oil-free, salt-free, and refined sugar-free. And it has all of your, you know, common categories. So it has breakfast, snacks, uh, handheld, soups, entrees, desserts, because who doesn't love plant-based desserts, right? And it's, this was really designed as like the myth buster for time. So the super easy was designed to bust the myth on difficulty. This one busts the myth on time. And then my third book, which is a little bit further away is this is everybody's favorite right now. The budget friendly plant-based diet cookbook. Now, of course the budget friendly book is all about those lower budget, really eating plant-based within a budget. And, you know, it's so important because the, the, the common thread that I started to hear was, well, eating plant-based is really expensive. It's really expensive. And I would agree. There's a lot of really expensive ingredients on the market, but it doesn't have to be. And one of the big things I found, especially switching from whole plant foods or from vegan foods to whole plant foods is that I could control more of the budget because I wasn't buying 
burgers that are $8.99 a serving. I wasn't buying vegan cheeses that are $8 a package. I was able to really look at ways that I could make it fit my budget and fit what I was looking to spend. I also have tips in there on how to not waste food because I feel that that's one of the big expenditures people have is that we start this plant-based way of eating. We go to the grocery store, we buy all these fresh vegetables and then we throw them out. And so we really want to help you learn how to plan those in, use them and not have that food waste. Yeah. You know, I always wonder the people that claim that plant-based eating is expensive, unless they're eating from the dollar menu at a fast food restaurant, what are they eating that's cheap? Because animal products are not cheap. No, they're very expensive. So I don't know. I think it's just the sticker shock. You know, when you, when you go from animal products where you can get, you know, a a bag of shredded cheese for two for $5, at least, I don't know. I haven't bought cheese in eight years. So I'm not really sure if that's accurate anymore. And nowadays, but, and then you look at the vegan cheese, that's like 699 a bag in your mind. You're, you're thinking, yeah, that is more expensive, but when you're comparing beans to animal, you know, to animal proteins. I mean, there's such a a distinguishable difference in, in budget and in the ability to save money eating this way. You know what I've noticed, and you might be able to speak to this since you're traveling so much and going to stores you've never been to. I find that, you know, obviously if you buy hundred percent organic, it's going to be costlier than conventional, but I found that you can get amazing prices as ethnic markets on, on bulk things like beans and rice. I mean, I've seen them for 50 cents a pound and what can be cheaper than that? Have you found any favorite ethnic stores in all the 29 states you visited? Uh, some we have, we do, we do really, we tend to lean more toward the bulk stores where, or co-ops where we can buy things in bulk and then store them. It allows us to buy what we need versus having to buy big pounds or, or have this excessive amount of, um, items to store. So a lot of times we'll look for those co-ops or the local farm stands or the farmer's market. We tend to shop at a lot of the, the local seasonal type places. Uh, just because it's so exciting to be traveling and, and taking advantage of what's in season in each state that we're in at that time. Nice. Have you found any unique fruits, vegetables, or starches in your travels that maybe you weren't familiar with? Not particularly, but I will say that, and this is this is a funny thing to find that's that's unique. I had never seen dried mint before or dried cilantro or any of the herbs that I normally use fresh, maybe it's because I never looked for them or maybe my local grocery stores when I lived in a sticks and bricks didn't have them. But that was something that was interesting to me because I always buy mint and cilantro fresh. So to find them was pretty unique. I thought that was interesting. That's cool. So Kathy, what's the Eat More Plants Academy? Uh, Yes. So our Eat More Plants Academy is our 12 month high touch coaching program. And the goal is to help aspiring plant eaters or even vegan eaters create healthy habits around plant-based foods. So it's not prescriptive planning. It's really about learning how to fit plant-based foods into their life. And at the end, that transformation you're looking for, becoming that intuitive plant-based eater, the person who's getting up in the morning, they know what they're going to eat. There's no more guesswork. There's no more, I don't know how to eat plant-based because through the Academy, through the Eat More Plants Academy, you really are equipped with the systems, the strategies, the habits, the foods, and the thinking required to make that transformational shift. Nice. I love it. I love it. What is the Meal Accountability Club? That's a new feature that you're offering, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. So I'm a huge proponent of teaching people how to meal plan. I always joke that my philosophy on meal planning is very similar to the Chinese proverb, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime with, with, we're going to change it to be more, you know, vegan. If I teach people, if I give people meal plans, their planning, their eating is only going to go as far as those ingredients that they like. It's only going to go as far as what they can fit into their schedule. But when I teach people how to meal plan, how to become consistent meal planners, holding them accountable, giving them variations that work with their schedule, they can really become lifelong meal planners and implementing that strategy helps them achieve their personal wellness goals by being able to stick with the the intentional foods that they wanna eat. So the Meal Plan Accountability Club is a weekly club. It meets every week 
And we go through different variations of meal plan templates that I've created that work for me, that work for my clients, that help you stick with that intentional way of eating that you're looking for. We have a huge recipe arsenal with links to all sorts of recipes all over the internet, not just mine, as well as uh, that accountability support, the community aspect. And it allows people to you know, join where they are and then grow into being this consistent meal planner with somebody holding their hand along the way. We're really excited to launch that. Yeah. What is what I've never meal planned before? Is this for me? You know? <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. We hear that all the time. So it ranges from beginners, brand new. We're going to give you a beginner's checklist, get you started out. You know, I always tell people my number one tip with meal planning is to grab your calendar because when you plan according to your schedule, there's nothing that there's less hiccups that you have. There's nothing worse than coming home and saying, oh, I'm going to make this recipe and finding out that you needed to soak cashews three days ago or that you needed to, you know, it's a 90 minute recipe and you've only got 30 minutes to cook. So we really teach you how to fit it into your life, not how to not to make meal planning this extra chore that you need to do. Right. Does batch cooking come up at all in meal planning for you? It can definitely. I do, you know, there's one of the beauties about meal planning is that you can plan to prep. So I have clients that will say, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to eat the starch and salad, which I'm going to show you later today. And my plan is to prep all of my starches on one day so they can batch cook those ingredients. And maybe it's setting aside a couple hours on Sunday to do it. Or maybe it's part of another meal. You know, they might have a stir fry for dinner one night. So they batch a huge batch of rice in the instant pot and then they have it for their lunches through the week. That allows them that flexibility to be able to say, okay, my starch is planned. Now all I have to do at lunchtime is toss together my my veg, my salad, whatever it is. Nice. Have you ever heard, uh, uh, this doesn't happen often, but I've, occasionally people say, I don't like leftovers. I, I love leftovers. I think they taste better than the original personally. You know, it's funny. I didn't used to like leftovers. I, I was the person who, really balked at meal preparation because I didn't want to eat the same thing every day. And what I found is for me, leftovers are repurposed. That's one of the tips that I have in um, a couple of the cookbooks is how to repurpose those leftovers. So let's say you make chili on a Sunday night and now you've, now you've got this huge pot of chili and what are you going to do with it? Well, maybe the next day you eat that chili over a potato and make like a chili potato. Maybe the next day you eat that chili on a carrot dog. So now you have like a chili dog. And so you're using that leftover, but you're repurposing it through the week. So you don't feel like you're eating the same thing. Now, I love a big pot of soup in the fridge that I can ladle out and heat up whenever I want. That is one of my favorite, favorite leftovers or batch cooked meals. But I understand that some people don't like to eat the same thing every day. So we kind of, we look at, if that's a, if that's an obstacle for you, we're going to look at that specifically. We're going to talk about how you can repurpose it, how you can make that work. And in the, in the accountability club, we do have the option for hot seat coaching. So that might be a question that somebody brings to me and says, gosh, you have all these amazing recipes, but I don't want to eat them the second day. What can I do with them? And, and a lot of times it's, you know, change up the way that you're using it. If you're roasting veggies for tacos, don't mix them all with the taco seasoning, just mix what you're going to use tonight. And then the next day, maybe heat that up with a little soy sauce, little aminos, little maple syrup, and now you have a stir fry. So just looking at ways that you can make the, make the ingredient and then flavor it up differently throughout the week. Yeah, that, that, that is, that's brilliant. And I, I don't know about you, but I love freezing things because then I can pull them out when I'm in a hurry and maybe didn't meal prep or meal plan that day. Absolutely. And, you know, there's so many things that you can freeze, you can freeze cooked rice, you can freeze soups, you can freeze chilies, you can freeze stews, you can freeze sauces. It really does give you another avenue of how to use, how to leverage the different foods and the different things you're cooking in another way. Now, what happens to a lot of clients, at least a couple of my clients, they'll say, oh, I have all this frozen food in the, in the freezer and I always forget to use it. And so we actually teach you how to pull, pull that list together and then plan those in so maybe it's a backup meal when you don't feel like cooking. Maybe it's an intentional meal on a day that you don't have time to cook. Maybe it's the day that you're running in a hundred directions to the chauffeur mom, or 
you have appointments or whatever it might be, it allows you to kind of use those to fit again into your schedule. Do you have any freezing tips like um, what containers or like when's the best time to freeze? Obviously, you don't, if it's hot, you don't put it right in the freezer at that moment. Correct. So typically what I do is I put everything I put everything into the refrigerator first and then move it from the refrigerator to the freezer. Now our situation is a little unique because our freezer won't freeze everything solid. Unfortunately for us, bananas will not freeze. There's too, there's too much sugar content and the freezer doesn't get cold enough to freeze them solid. Um, so a lot of times we will freeze in much smaller portions so that our RV refrigerator can can handle what we're freezing. Um, some things that I do like to freeze, I like to freeze tomato paste in one tablespoon portions. I like to freeze rice in one cup portions because I have a couple of recipes that I make consistently um, that use a cup of rice, a, a cup of cooked rice. I also like to freeze any leftover tomatoes or tomato sauces, pasta sauces, and any soups that we don't eat. Um, but as I've said before, I'm a really, really, really expert meal planner. And it's often that every bit of food is, is put to good use before, before it needs to hit the freezer. Nice. Nice. Uh, what do you have any recipes that are just like your most popular that people that follow you maybe on social media that just love and sing the praises of? Uh, definitely. So our chickpea, El, chickpea taco, chickpea El Pastor tacos, which is in the super easy cookbook in the one pot section. It's a sheet pan meal is one of the most popular recipes on veginspire.com. And ironically, our best vegan taco filling is also up there as one of the most popular. So I don't know if that the people I like, people who follow me love tacos, or if it's because my love of tacos promotes those out a lot more. But those are two very, very popular recipes. And then the two recipes that I'm going to show you all today, um, they are my most popular. So when I meal plan, these two recipes are on my meal plan almost every week in some type of rotation. And so I wanted to share them with you today so that you could get an idea of, you know, a glimpse into how I plan and how I utilize similar foods to keep that plan going, to keep that momentum going. Great. I would love to see it. You know, do you ever eat a meal maybe that isn't planned, but it's just components of items that you prepped, like, you know, bowls or wraps or salads, but you know, it's not like a recipe, but you had some beans, you had some grains, maybe you had some vegetables left over. Absolutely. I call those uh, no recipe meals and they actually hit the plan in like clean out the fridge or bowl Thursday. So that might be the day that I say, got all these random things, let's put them together. Oftentimes it's little bits of chili, little bits of soup, little bits of a sauce that are left together that we can pull in. And then the other thing is our, I consistently plan what I call starch and salad for our lunches. And that is really another way to use up those random things. So in my case, my starch and salad this week, the recipe I'm going to share with you all was cooked sweet potatoes. So I have, I have my bowl started right here. I have cooked sweet potatoes. Then I have tons of like green leafy, green leafies that have been cooked, cut up, onions, carrots, and tomatoes. And then to this, I would add about a half a cup of black beans that have been drained and rinsed. So these could be any beans that you have in the fridge, right? This the salad side of this could be any vegetable that you have in the fridge. The starch on this could be any starch that you have in the fridge. Maybe it's leftover rice. Maybe it's, you know, sweet potatoes. Maybe it's just boiled white potatoes that you intended for something else, but you didn't get around to it. And so you want to use that up. So I throw starch and salad on there. Sometimes I will throw um, roasted vegetables on it. If I have some roasted vegetables, uh, broccoli, cauliflower, if I have other ingredients that I'm trying to use up, maybe... Maybe I didn't get to fit all the broccoli into the stir fry pan. So I have some fresh broccoli. I'll throw that on there. And then I'm going to share with you a really easy salad dressing that doesn't require the blender because that's one of the complaints I hear all the time is I just need quick rest, quick sauces. Just give me a quick sauce so that I can make this up. And this sauce is very popular in amongst my clients. They talk about it all the time. 
So I'm going to throw on some beans on this. Let me move it back so you guys can see a little bit. And then I can share my dressing, which like I said, is super easy. Well, that so we'll put some delicious. Even, that. Before, even before you put the beans on, it looked delicious. A sweet potato. Bowl. I know. I'm telling you, sweet potatoes and black beans are like the perfect combination. I don't know if I'm, the, hopefully I'm not the only one that thinks that way. So the recipe that I want to share is my maple mustard dressing. Now, everything can kind of be modified a little bit. If you don't want to use maple, you can use date syrup. We've tried it with that. You could throw it in the blender and just use dates. Um, but we, we like maple syrup, so we're going to start there. So it starts with four tablespoons of spicy brown mustard. And I love my cookie scoops for this. So this is my two tablespoon cookie scoop. So I'm just gonna squeeze out some of that mustard. Oops, I got it all over the counter. That's very clever. And then some cookie scoop as a measuring spoon. Two tablespoons of the ma of the maple syrup. Actually, four tablespoons. So it's four tablespoons of mustard, four tablespoons of maple syrup. And this is the this is our Vermont maple syrup. When we traveled through Vermont, we went to the maple syrup people. And then the next item is two teaspoons of seasoned or unseasoned rice vinegar, depending on your preference. And I just use the regular spoon that I'm gonna stir it with. Again, no dishwasher. And then I put tahini in it to give it a little bit of a thickness, but some people opt to add another type of bird. It just depends on what you're, what you're going for. So just two little teaspoons of tahini paste. Now, tahini is one of those ingredients that we um, always have to kind of seek out because it's not in all of the grocery stores that we go to, but we love this Mighty Sesame brand. I'm not sponsored by them, but I just love it. It's, it's very flavorful. It's clean. You can get an organic and it comes in a squeeze bottle, which makes it really easy to use. Sometimes I will just dress my salad with a flavored vinegar and then a quick drizzle of that tahini to add that creaminess. Not a lot of tahini, just a little. That's great. The squeeze bottle. I love it. Yeah. So for some people, they might say, this is, I don't want all that dressing. And a lot of times we will actually dress our greens with us with a flavored vinegar and then just use a little bit of the maple mustard. So it's up to you. Um, but then I just dress the salad with my maple mustard. I put it over everything, the beans, the potato and the greens and veggies. And then that's my starch and salad. It's easy. It's always on my menu. I always have the ingredients to whip up the easy salad dressing and it's flavorful and I can use any ingredient. So when I'm meal planning, I'll put the starch and salad on the, on the lunch menu. I prep my starch and then I take 10 minutes at lunchtime to chop up my vegetables, whip up a quick dressing and I'm eating a nourishing lunch that provides me the energy to keep going for the rest of the day. And it looks absolutely delicious. Oh yeah. Let me dress it. And then I'll, I will uh, show you all again. Ah, there we go. You just want to take a big scoop bite, don't you? I mean, it looks like a restaurant made that. It's beautiful. And it's as simple as that. And, you know, I always tell people, like, it's as easy as just putting the food into into a plate, foods that you like, foods that are familiar. There's nothing in this in this dish that's scary or, you know, ominous for people. Maybe you didn't eat sweet potatoes growing up. I didn't really eat sweet potatoes growing up. But everything else is a pretty common ingredient. And when you start feeding yourself and making this transition in eating those types of foods that are common, you aren't scaring people off with tofus and tempehs and these other ingredients that they might not know what they are. Wow, that is brilliant. How do you prefer to cook your sweet potatoes? Roasted, steamed? Oh yeah, I was going to share that too. So these sweet potatoes, which are all, I, I covered them up with the beans now, but you could see that really beautiful caramelization. So I heat the oven to, uh, it would be in your ovens, it would be 375. I have a convection oven, so I heat it to 400. So it'd be 375 Fahrenheit in a standard oven. And I cut the sweet potatoes in half. And then I use a little salt and pepper on my no stick pan or on a par parchment lined baking sheet. 
And then I put them cut side down and I just let them leave them alone and let them bake for about, depending on the size, these ones were about 40 minutes and they get this beautiful caramelization. They're nice and seasoned. I use organic sweet potatoes so I can eat, I eat the skin and everything. Um, and I just love them. They're easy to heat up. You can eat them cold. You can eat them warm. I really like them just halved that way. And then, and then baked in the, in the oven. Yeah, that's how they always used to cook them at True North. They're delicious that way. I, I find sometimes, depending on what type of sweet potato, it's sometimes hard to cut through a, a large sweet potato. It is very hard to cut through a large sweet potato. And the funny thing is, is when we left, when we left, we sold our meat. Uh, we didn't use it ever as a meat cleaver. It was more the cleaver to cut the squash and the sweet potatoes. And so now we use a chef's knife. And I'm always, you know, just gently rocking it back and forth, being very conscious of where my fingers are, because you want to make sure that you cut it in half, but you don't want to cut any of your extremities off while you're doing it. Absolutely. Well, you maybe can get one of those meat cleavers because we used to use those in culinary school to open coconuts. Yes. Yes. We used to have a coconut key or something that you use too. It's crazy. Well, that, that is delicious. So that would be like a lunch. It could be a dinner. Do you have breakfast prep ideas as well? I do. So I have, it's, I call it the veg inspired oat bowl. And then we actually put it, I put it into the cookbook, the super easy cookbook uh, under five ingredient meals as the berry oat bowl. Um, and what I do is I take, I make it ahead of time but it's not an overnight oats bowl. Um, I really like the texture of the oats when they've softened slightly, but they're not that really cold kind of mushiness that overnight oats creates. So this is what I do. I do a half a cup, usually a heaping half a cup of old fashioned rolled oats. And I just use simple old organic old fashioned rolled oats. And then next up I do, now it's not in the cookbook, but I always put about a tablespoon of ground flax in my oatmeal bowl. Um, so I just do ground flax, ground flax seed. And then I put in, now this is where the variations come in. And this is really where you start to kind of explore um, your personality. So you can use fresh berries. Now for me, I like to buy frozen because they're picked at their peak season. They're always usually fresh and tasty. I can mix, I can get a mixed bag of berries. I can get blueberries. I can get strawberries. So it's about a half to a cup of either fresh or frozen berries. Like I said, I usually use frozen. So I put those in there. And then the next ingredient is a half a cup of unsweetened plant milk. Now I'm pretty particular. I like my plant milk to have about two ingredients, whatever they're milking. So soy, nuts, whatever it is, oats, and the water. I don't want my ingredients, my, my plant milks to have a bunch of other ingredients. I don't want sweeteners and gums and salts and all that stuff. So this, this week, I think we have soy milk. So it's just organic soybeans and water. So we just add that to the bowl. And then in this variation, we do use a little bit of sweetener. So in our case, we're going to use a little maple syrup. Just drizzle that on about a tablespoon or whatever you have. If you have date syrup or date sugar goes really well in these bowls. Um, or if you have, you know, another sweetener that you use, maybe you like to use mashed banana. And then the last thing I put in is a little bit of vanilla. So I'm going to do just a dash of vanilla. This allows me to kind of get that vanilla y flavor without having to have the weird vanilla flavored plant milks. And then last up is just to stir it, which I lost my spoon. I'll use my measuring cup. You just you stir it around. Go ahead. I was wondering if you ever tried my favorite vanilla powder. No, but I need to. That sounds awesome. Really good. And, and why is Vermont maple syrup different or better? Oh, gosh. I don't know why it's better. It's maybe because it's local. Um, I did learn something. So maple syrup can be purchased in different 
grades and different colors. And I actually learned that the darker the maple syrup, the colder it was when they made the maple syrup. And the dark flavor has a very robust, like deep, deep maple flavor. That's actually my favorite. Um, but most people like the the amber or the middle level because it's not as dark, not as deep of a flavor. But I really love the dark maple syrup. And so, yeah, we're planning on going, when we go back through Vermont in a, in a couple of weeks, we're planning on going um to another Vermont farm, a maple farm and an apple orchard to kind of really connect with the nature out there. So, okay. So with my bowl, I just leave this bowl to set on the counter for 30, 45 minutes. So it allows the oats to kind of get soft and tasty. And if you're using frozen fruit, it allows the frozen fruit to thaw. It's not as they're not, the oats aren't as softened as overnight oats and they're, but they're still cool or cold, more like a cereal. This is what I put on my meal plan every morning. So my meal plans look like veg inspired oat bowls for breakfast. Start, this is one variation, starch and salad, which I showed you with the sweet potatoes and the salad for lunch. And then my dinners pick three dinners a week and I eat dinner on Monday, leftovers on Tuesday, dinner on Wednesday, leftovers on Thursday, dinner on Friday, leftovers on Saturday. And then maybe we'll do some really fun, extravagant meal on Sunday. Like, I don't know, tamales with all the fixings, or we'll make pecan ball, you know, pecan veggie balls and pasta and a homemade pasta sauce. So it allows us to kind of have this routine and we're, we're very simple and very budget friendly to buy the fresh ingredients that we need. Or sometimes we use frozen to make our meal plan really fit our lifestyle. Sounds amazing. If So we'll put the link in the show notes, of course. And if people are interested in trying it, is it is it a monthly service? Is it annual? How does that work? Yeah, so it's a monthly, you can, you can, you can enroll for a month or a year um, and you can enroll for as long as you want. It, it's recurring, but you can cancel any time. And it, we meet weekly. So you have the accountability and the instruction on your meal plans every single week. So as if you can show up, we're there helping you with your meal plans, helping you make your plant-based meals fit into your lifestyle. It's really a great, great way for people to create that order that allows them to be very intentional. One of the things I hear people say all the time when they're making this transition is, I just, I just get pulled back into my old habits. I can't seem to figure out what I'm doing at dinner time. I get home from work and I'm tired. And I say, well, what'd you eat for lunch? And they're like, oh, well, I skipped lunch because I didn't have time to make it. And so this takes that guesswork out. It helps you create some order in your life. And, and you know, meal planning for me has been a lifesaver. I've been doing it for over six years. I started meal planning even before I was eating whole food plant-based. We were still eating vegan. And the reason I started meal planning then was because we would get a CSA box of all these amazing vegetables and we never knew what to do with them. So they'd go to waste in the fridge and, or we would go to Whole Foods and stock up a whole cartload of food and then get home after an hour long commute and not want to cook. And so meal planning gave us the, the intention and the, it created order. And that's what I really want to help people do is help them create order around the preparation and, and cooking and planning of their meals. Wow. I think it's wonderful. Have you ever tried savory oats? I have tried savory oats. I actually like them a lot. Uh, we did, we did one. I, I think it's in the super easy cookbook. I get, can, when you have so many cookbooks, I can't, I wrote them so close together. I can't remember which book it's in, um, but we have tried savory oats and I really like polenta. Um, as a, as a morning option as well. And so sometimes we'll put those on and then steel cut oats come up a lot for us as well, because we can throw them in the instant pot and make a big batch of steel cut oats. And then we usually add my favorite thing to add to my steel cut oats are blueberries and cardamom. They're just, the steel cut oats are super simple. It's steel cut oats, water, and a dash of salt. And then, um, blueberries and cardamom, just take it over the top. I mean, I just love that combination. 
You know, I, I might have asked you this on a previous show, but I don't remember the answer. If you're always on the move, like, what is your driver's license? Like, do you have a, an address? Or like, like, where do you live? And- we do. So we live in Florida. We, uh, we use a, a, a mail service that allows us to declare domicile through their, their organization. So we are Florida residents, Florida driver's license. Um, and we, we get our mail through this mail service. So all of our mail goes to a, a huge building, ironically in Texas, not in Florida. So we have two addresses and then we order that mail to either a campground or a family member or a friend's house as we're passing through so that we can get our mail. But a lot of the things are, are done digitally now. So, you know, e-billing and all of that is very, very common and easy to, to make this, this digital nomad life happen. That, I think it's just so fascinating. I mean, I would love to watch a docu-series or just a YouTube just on your day-to-day life because I think about things more like, what if her cat needs to go to the vet? I mean, you can't go back to Florida in a second, you know? Yeah. So that, so unfortunately we, when we, well, let me, let's not say the word, unfortunately. So we left the left Pittsburgh with three cats and we've lost two over the last three years. And we did have to seek out veterinary care on the road. Um, And, you know, when you, when you travel full time with a pet, you really need to be aware of what those options are. And, uh, Murphy was our, he's our, was our second cat, I suppose. He actually had hyperthyroidism. And so we had to order him medication. So we would order it and then the veterinarian would have to approve it. And so just these little things like that, like my hair appointments, you know, medical appointments, you, you have to plan those in. So I've become a very diligent planner as we pass through Florida or even through our home you know, our home base of Pittsburgh, I wouldn't say it's our home base, but when we pass through home, I see my hairdresser, I might get my teeth cleaned, things of that nature. It allows us to have some semblance of normalcy as we're, as we're traveling in, in living this extravagant, you know, adventure. Well, if you figured out your meal accountability planner, I'm sure you did the same thing kind of for your life. Have you been to California yet? Not yet. Not yet. It's, I always say it's on the list. We are headed out to uh, Mon- uh, Colorado. We're doing the Colorado, Utah next summer. And then we'll either swing up through Montana, Washington, Oregon, California to get down to Arizona, or we'll go down to Arizona and then swing up the other way. We, The wonderful thing about traveling this way is that you can pick which way you go. The hardest part is picking which way you go. Like I say to my husband all the time, how do we decide what we're going to do? How do we decide where we're going to go? And we just kind of go with a what feels good and what where what national parks we want to do. And then if there's any special adventures or, you know, family events, we try to plan that in. Now, we plan six months in advance. So a lot of times people will spring an adventure on us and it's not as easy to just reroute. You know, you've got RV. It's like would be like rerouting your vacation. You know, I've got RV park reservations. You know, I might have a hair appointment at, you know, just different things that we've planned in. And so we try to let people know, you know, if you're thinking of something, try to give us, you know, four or five, six months so that we can make sure that we re- reroute that way. So if they're writing you to a wedding or a bar mitzvah, tell you now. Absolutely. Don't, don't yeah. wait till, don't wait for a month out because I'm likely going to be across the country. Right. Well, I hope if you come through California, you'll say hello. It'd be great to, to see you and meet you. That would be, that would be just so much fun. Wow. What, what yeah, an, absolutely. What an interesting life you have. That is just, you know, I'm, I'm imagining though, two of the states which aren't attached to the United States, Hawaii and Alaska, you probably can't get there through an RV. Uh, you can take your RV through Canada up the can Alaska, Alaska Canadian highway. Uh, and we actually follow some YouTubers that have done that. Um, it's on our radar. We just don't know if we would do it with this 35 foot fifth wheel or if another RV is in the, in the works in the future, uh, that might be a little more compact that can kind of go through all the Alaskan roads and, and allow us to be a little more off the grid. This requires full hookups and a little more on grid living and Alaska, man, you could go anywhere if you could be off grid solar water, you know, different things like that. So it's, it's in the, it's in the works. And then I think Hawaii, we're just going to have to fly and, you know, 
camp on the beach or something so that we can say we went there. Yeah, that'll be fabulous. Well, when people say, oh, it's too hard to eat plant-based in my 3,000 square foot house, I'm like, well, interesting because I know somebody that's doing it in an RV and has been doing it for a long time. Well, thank you so much for making healthy eating not only delicious and easy, and but also accessible and fun. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. I appreciate you having me and I, I love sharing. So if you're out, if you're watching this, connect with me on Instagram, connect with me down here on YouTube and, and we'll, uh, we'll chat. I'll be in the comments after and hang out with you. That's great. Thanks so much, Kathy. This was awful fun. Thanks for having me, Chef AJ. My pleasure. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when my guest is Chef Mark Reinfeld, who is going to be making an autumn cobbler. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.